cargo came out and uh, said that your dismissal were not politically really motivated, that it was to sanitize the system. What's your reaction to this? Uh, well, let me first thank you for having us on hand. And what I will say to that is to ask some basic questions. When issues of staff discipline get to the level of associations not known to the statute of the university, like concerned young alumni, association of professors and associate professors not known to our books as well. Then how many times has it happened that when staff are disciplined in the university, it calls on the office of the vice chancellor to call for a press conference? So maybe when we answer these questions, it will tell anybody who is interested and discerning enough to see whether it is political or otherwise. Part of some of the statements made uh, was that due process was followed as far as uh, the, the status was uh, the, of the institution is concerned. As far as this is concerned, a panel was set up uh, led by one professor to investigate this and you know a report was given so due process will you agree to the fact that due process was followed or are you saying due process was not followed is that what you are implying at this time it's amazing as well as amusing when you have um, people who you look up to as senior when you look at the spread of colleagues, because if you are a senior lecturer, a professor is a senior in that wise. And when you talk of the statute of the university, it doesn't provide for a vice chancellor fact-finding panel. Our books are simple in its provisions. The commencement point of the disciplinary procedure is the department. If the department satisfies itself that a case uh, is established, it moves to the faculty. And once the faculty is convinced that, yes, what obtains at the lower level of the department is uh, actually uh, sustainable, then it goes to the Senate Council Joint academic disciplinary committee. That's not what obtained in my case. And that of the vice chairman which the university had gone to the media to publish, because I know. I passed through the vice chancellor's fight finding committee. I was even quest to attend because you need to see the content of the invite. And that of the vice chair, I know they didn't start from his department. I don't know what you call. Let me come to you. The chairman had outlined some of this uh, process. What exactly are the due process that was supposed to be followed as far as disciplinary action is concerned based on the statutes of the institution? Thank you very much. Like you have said, the basic point is for you to let the case start from the department, move to the faculty, and if at that level you still feel that the person in question has a case to answer. You then take it to the Joint Committee of Senate and Council. Now, in the case of the Shia, we had the Professor Mike Ikariale panel, constituted by the Vice Chancellor, which he attended. Of course, we made the point at that stage that this body is unknown to our laws. In any case, they made their findings made some ridiculous recommendations and then forwarded the case to the Joint Senate Council Committee. In the case of the Vice Chair, the case started from the faculty where we 
had two reports, a majority report and a minority report. The minority report stated very clearly that the vice chair had no case to answer. But we have a situation on our hands where we have answers already. The management was merely looking for questions. And so inevitably, it went to the Joint Senior Council Committee, as we expected. And so about a week ago, the council made pronouncements, which, from what we know, even contradicts the findings of its own committee. And so they went about all this drama, got to the meeting of council, as we have reliably learned, without circulating reports for members to consider. In the case of the shared device share and two other cases, brought PowerPoint projectors, hurriedly read through the recommendations, not even bothering to show who signed which reports, because we doubt that the report presented in few minutes in those PowerPoint presentations were actually signed by members of that committee. And so they simply ratified the dismissal. And that is the reason why you find them sending their representatives to the media, sponsoring some funny bodies being put together in order to, you know, patch up what can simply not be fight. They had the icing on the cake when the vice chancellor addressed the media. The onslaught has been unprecedented because they know that this will not stand. But they are hell-bent on doing as much damage as possible. Bad news sells very fast. There is nothing as good as going to town to say this lecturer has attempted to collect money from students, this one altered marks, and they have been using the paraphernalia of the of the offices as officers of the union to shield themselves. It sells. It's just like the anti-corruption thing we have. So when you now talk, they say, oh, they are fighting back because they are union officials. But we all understand the subcontext to this. We understand the game plan. The issue here is that you have a management that thrives on impunity. You have in office a vice chancellor who wishes to relate with the public as a gentleman, but deep down within him wants to run the university as if it's a private fiefdom, a place where wins and caprices determine who gets what in violation of rules and regulations. A vice chancellor who can arbitrarily decide as against the provision of our laws as to whether he needs deputy vice chancellors or not. A vice chancellor who prefers to appoint people into offices in acting capacities rather than holding elections into those offices in accordance with our rules in expectation that people so appointed we reciprocate by being lawyer, even when their conduct will violate the principles of our conditions of service or the university status. And so these are the things we've been combat uh, combating as a union since its administration came in. And so when all these cases started, we knew inevitably that we would have to travel down this path. But it's very unfortunate that having emerged from a crisis in 2015, a man who came into office with the public having so much expectation, especially on our side too, we had just felt that, okay, that's when we we'll have this breeding, you know, space. At least within the next five years, since there won't be any tozu for second time and all that, just come in, do the things you need to do in accordance with the rules, and everybody will be fine. Unfortunately, we have to go this path again. And let, let, let me just try to get this clarification because a lot of people are wondering 
the present vice chancellor, that's Professor Larry Wadju Pabo, tried to absolve himself, so to say, saying that uh, the dismissal was he inherited the petition uh, from the past vice chancellor, that's Professor John Obayoana. How do you let me because I like try as much as possible to paint the scenario briefly. In 2011-12, there about a student of the university sent a message to then Governor Fashola, who forwarded the message to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Bafunwa, who sent the message down to the Director of the External System, Dr. Abani Konda, investigates this case. And what was the allegation? That Dr. Isaac Oyemumi, who didn't teach these students, but who merely act as the collation officer for the results when lecturers must have taught and graded the script and submitted results, asked for 50,000 naira to do his job of collating results submitted by different lecturers. The case was investigated at the point, and Dr. Isaac Oyumi actually had an interaction with the then director, Dr. Abani Konda, wherein he told him that he himself had actually investigated the matter. That it is true that certain students go about dropping names, dropping the names of lecturers to solicit money from students, but that he didn't solicit. And so these students in 2016 October wrote a petition to the Attorney General as the Vice Chancellor has claimed in his press release, who now forwarded, who now wrote him and directed him to take action on the case. According to him, that's the, that's the point at which he now decided, that was the point at which he now decided to query Dr. Oyemumi. Certain things now played out. Because as you have been told, the Professor Mike Ikariale committee wasn't supposed to be. But it threw some light on some of these cases. We got to the panel. And these students, Abi Odunjola Osho, who petitioned, asked that the university management should save his soul because some of his mates who paid that 50,000 naira at that point are now graduates. But unfortunately, his own result cannot be found because he has refused to pay Dr. Oyemumi 50,000 naira since 2011 and he needs to graduate. But we go to the panel. And before he was asked three, four questions, he said he actually graduated 2012, 2013. But he suddenly woke up in 2016 again to remember that he has not graduated and petitioned. And so we needed to go and look at the brochure for 2013. Did he actually graduate? And so in the course of interrogation during that sitting, a member of the panel asked him, could you please tell us your name again? My names are Abiodun James Alabi. Oh? The name we have here on the petition is Jola Osho. Now you are James Alabi. Uh, yes, sir. I have an explanation. I am afraid if I had used my real name, Dr. Yeomi and his people would have killed me because they are very powerful people in the society. Professor Mike Ikariale at that point asked him to read the petition again and make up his mind whether he wants to adopt the content. He labored through it, read the petition, and said he stands by the content. Meaning, he stands by the content that, as at that point, January 9 this year, Dr. Yeung was still preventing him from graduating. But at the same time, he had graduated since 2013. Any right-thinking person at that point would have known that this is a case that somebody somewhere had investigated as far back as at that time, which didn't have any basis, but which somebody is just trying to resuscitate at this point in order for such a person to get back at the union. And so what happened was they now brought Dr. Abani Konda, with whom Dr. Yomi had interaction in 2011, at this point, they had doctored his tape. Yes, Dr. Oyemumi told him, I have investigated the case. Further explanations 
as to, yes, there are students who have been going around dropping names, but I didn't send anybody. All of that you have erased from the tape. So when you listen to that tape, you really don't even need to situate it with, within its proper context to understand that certain things just don't gel. And according to the Vice Chancellor, the, the chairman of our union has not been dismissed for attempting to demand bribe from a student in 2011 because he has admitted to it that Oshie uh, <laughs> Lelo A lot of Lagosians, a lot of people will want to know, did you at any point in time demand a bribe of 50,000 naira from any of the students? The answer is simple, no. The part of the statements that were made were that, that were documented, in fact, there were specific documented allegations of this misconduct. Was, was any documented, uh, documents given to you during the course of the panel investigation? No documents were given except for the manipulated tape of the interaction. And um, I wouldn't want to say much because naturally, you know, we'll be heading to the courts. But now that you mentioned that a lot of Lagosians will want to, you have two of the phrases of a conversation that um, went on for about 40 minutes, strewn up to mean, meaning by the high of the university that he must have done this. Um, I'm a social psychologist, and I know that we have three rules of interpretation. You have the mischief rule, you have the literary or otherwise called the statutory rule, and you have the golden rule. And so we have two schools of thought contending now. That of the union, which is where I belong, and that of the university authorities, where you have Professor Fagbon as the leader. We will meet in court and we want to see what those who have um, legally trained highs will see when these issues are tabled. Now, let me now get this. Uh, I mean, you intend to pursue justice naturally, naturally, from the legal perspective. I mean, knowing fully well the slow pace of the judicial system in this country. I mean, the uh, Congress was said to have dissolved your executive committee and set up a chaotic committee. What's the, I mean, how, how will you determine the strength of, uh, or the feeling of the, of other lecturers in this regard? I mean, will they be willing to go on an industrial action if that requires that? Having dissolved your executive committee? Um, I would like to respond to that. Nobody has dissolved the executive committee of our great union, you know, ASU Lasso branch. Yes, a few misguided colleagues would want to, as they have been making effort. The day of the meeting of the council, we learned that the meeting ended very late. Very early the following morning, armed security officers of the university tried to forcefully eject our share when he was even yet to receive the letter. Because all of this was pre-planned. But for the steadfastness of our members, they were practically going to bundle him and the vice chair out of the union secretariat. But unfortunately for some of these very few members working in concert with the university management, they lack a proper understanding of the constitution of ASU and the principles guiding the union. There are processes for bringing the tenure of an ESCO to an end. And when it is 
the proper time for you to conduct fresh elections, you must obtain the approval of NEC. So, it is impossible for them as they are trying to do to hijack the leadership of the union. But we know they are making efforts in the hope that they will install a pliant ESCO that will overlook the misdeeds, the impunities of the management. However, the luck that we have is that our union has traveled this path several times before. And this is one of the reasons why we have such checks and balances in place. It is for that purpose that we really need to restate what the zonal coordinator, Professor Shoande, said in his press release. That as far as our union is concerned, Dr. Isaac Akinwe Yoyewun remains the share Asu Lasu. Dr. Adibo Wale Adeyemi Suenu remains the vice chair of Asu Lasu until such a time when X says it is ripe for us to have a change in leadership. What they tried to do at that Congress was to railroad us into a situation where we will say Congress will take a decision as to whether the ESCO can be dissolved, but such things do not exist in our books. And in any case, you cannot subject a national decision, a decision taken at the national level or at the zonal level to the mutilation of a few members of the branch. And so that effort to truncate the press conference failed. Horribly, they needed to respond. They came up with this idea of body of professors and associate professors who came together to dissociate themselves from the content of the release of the zonal coordinator. But in order for them not to appear as if they are derailing from the union, they quickly, in the next paragraph, said, OK, we are aligning ourselves with the current national struggle of ASU. But you cannot pick the laws and principles of the union that you wish to abide with. You are either a loyal member of this union, a principled member of this union, or you are not. There are no half measures in ASU. So if you are comfortable with the principle of ASU that fights for your welfare, but you are not comfortable with the part of it that says this is how the leadership structure should be. There are procedures for making changes to that. What you, go, what you do is you go to NEC or NDC and make your presentations. If the majority buys the view, we will amend our constitution as such. So we know that there is an ongoing effort on the part of management to prop up some reactionaries so that they will be able to take over the leadership of the union. Unfortunately, our union has fortified itself against such invasion. And so, until further notice, Dr. Isaac Akinwe Yeyun, as I have said, remains the chair. Dr. Suenu remains the vice chair of our union. One final question, then, which is bordering on your agitation. The vice chancellor actually know that your union, your, your leadership has actually been virile against every form of impunity that they've had. And uh, one of the things that most students would want to find out was that was there, is there any attempt to increase tuition fee really by this management? We know that the current governing council of Lasso has discussed extensively on the modalities for reviewing the tuition of the university, the tuition being paid by students in the university. The position is that as at the time the tuition was increased the other time, it wasn't politically expedient. But 
now they have found it unsustainable and there is a need for them to jack up to shop. So what they have done is to mandate the vice chancellor go and engage stakeholders and convince them so that they will see reason why tuition in Lasso has to go up again. If he is denying it, I, I will simply laugh. We will see how things unfold. But we know that the council consider, considered it. Papers were issued to that effect. There are council papers to that effect. And so if the vice chancellor will come out and deny what is what has been written down in black and white, it's just unfortunate. It's unfortunate if the chief executive officer of the university will come out and deny that the management is not considering increasing tuition. We know. But it is just one of the legs. And that is one of the reasons why our union is against such policies. When Professor Bafuma was going to do this, we warned him it would backfire. In my own department, Department of Philosophy, where we used to have an average of 60 to 80 students admitted in a year, they introduced this policy, and that year we got about 14 students. Inevitably, students or applicants will not be able to afford this tuition. Lasso will not be a university of choice any longer. And these people will come back, like they did in the days of Professor Bafunga, to say that some programs are not viable because students are not applying for them. What does that lead to? You want to close down such departments because they are not economically viable. You have to lay off members of staff. So, outside the conviction of our union that there is a swelling attempt to take education, tertiary education out of the reach of the average negotiation, we are self-interested because we know that inevitably it will affect us too. It will affect our jobs. And we know that this state can run a world-class university with a range of fees that negotiations can afford. So what we are seeing unfolding in Lasso is the unleashing of a series of steps, not only to increase tuition, to bring in promotion policies for members of staff that will make it difficult more than it is presently for them to gain promotion. They are testing the waters already. In one of our faculties, you have a release to the effect that before you get promoted, you must have attended within the last five years a number of international conferences. Three. Three. At least. At least. This is a university that has not sponsored anybody to any conference in the last five years. If you see people going to conferences in Lasso, it must be because we are using resources from Tet Fund. The university itself doesn't sponsor people. And so if you have not sent me to any local conference, talk less of an international conference, and you are saying without attending an international Welcome to Fallsville Luxury Hotel. At Fallsville Luxury Hotel, we offer excellent service. Our rooms have all the necessary facilities to make your stay comfortable and memorable. You will also have access to internet service, breakfast, 24 hour power supply, full air condition, free international calls, free time pumping service, and free car battery charge. So, what are you waiting for? Quickly visit Fallsville Luxury Hotel. We are located as number one at Delhi Roba Michele off Raja Rasaki Road, First Estate, Amuo, or the Fifth Stack Village. For more information or reservation, please call. Call us on 080-75-78-7135 or 080-99-90-0601. You can also take advantage of our online ongoing promo at www.forcevhotel.com to make your reservation and payment for your favorite room, which attracts a discount rate. Please note, rooms are reserved based on first come, first serve. Forcevhotel Hotel experience the home of comfort. They come, they come.